Hi there! Welcome to Pilot University. Today we are talking about the third course that you get to visit on New Pokemon Snap, the Blushing Beach on Maricopia Island. We've already talked about the large-scale diversity of the entire game in this video, as well as sort of the small-scale local diversity of both the park and jungle courses up in the playlist that this video is also in. So if you have not seen those, make sure to go check those out. During the day, the beach is toward the bottom of the rankings among all the courses for diversity, but the beach really comes alive at night where it jumps up to a tie for fifth place overall. The beach is, well, a beach. Particularly, a beach in a tropical region between the land and a reef in what's called the lagoon zone of the reef. With a couple of exceptions, most of the Pokemon found at the beach make sense to be at a beach. You can find sea cucumbers and sea urchins in these kind of environments in the real world pretty regularly, so it makes sense for Pukamuku and Marini, respectively, to be in this kind of environment in the Pokemon world. It also wouldn't really surprise me if a piece of the reef sort of broke off and was washed inland toward the shore, which is why Corsal is there too. In addition to all the life in the water, there would obviously be life sort of up on the shore as well. Animals like snakes really love this kind of place to sort of come out and bask in the sun and for places to find food, which is why you see Pokemon like Seviper there as well. It's also great for Pokemon like Executor and Blossom that are plant-based to soak up some sunlight. I say that there are some exceptions for Pokemon that I would expect to see here, because once again, Pokemon fell into a trap of their own making that they always seem to, in that they put Pokemon in water that they don't belong in. There is a, a really extreme difference between salt water and fresh water in terms of what types of animals can live in each. And I know what you're thinking. There are a few different kinds of species in the real world that can move between fresh water and salt water. Things like bull sharks, things like salmon, uh, several kinds of eels do it as well. But they are by far the minority. But none of them can live outside of their type of water for all that long. They will eventually have to come back or they will die. Each sort of type of animal, whether it lives in fresh water or salt water, needs to regulate the ions in its blood in order for its bodily functions to function. When you are in fresh water, your blood has a higher concentration of ions than the water around you does. Meaning that just sort of the way nature works, it always tries to move things from high to low, it'll actually sort of do sort of what's counterintuitive. It won't move the ions from your body out. It will move water from the outside in to you. It is much easier for water to move itself into your blood than the ions to move out. So it will try to dilute your blood by bringing water in. That's just sort of how nature tries to balance out that ion gradient. And so, most things that live in fresh water are really good at getting rid of excess water. They do this mostly through sort of chemical processes in their cells, but also by urinating a lot. That's why if you pick up like a pond turtle or a frog, they'll usually try to pee on you because they are constantly having to get rid of excess water, so they're constantly full of urine. When you are in salt water, the opposite is true. The ocean water around you has a higher concentration of ions than your blood does. And sort of following that logic, the water in your blood wants to leave to dilute the water around you to equal out that gradient. Animals that live in salt water are really, really good at conserving water and keeping that water in, again, mostly through chemical processes in their cells, but also by making really concentrated urine and not urinating all that often, if like ever. Because this is how their entire metabolism is structured, most animals can't just, you know, flip a switch and be able to move from freshwater to saltwater or vice versa. If you take a freshwater fish and put it in the ocean, it will die of dehydration very quickly because their entire body is structured to remove water. And because they have uh, a lower concentration of ions than the water around them does, that's what nature wants to do too. It wants to remove water from them and push it out to try to dilute the water around them. And so, all of the water will leave their cells, and the, their cells will shrivel up and they will die of dehydration. If you take a saltwater fish 
and put it in fresh water, the opposite will happen. They are so good at bringing in water without the ions that their cells will fill up too much with water and their cells will explode because they can't handle the extra pressure from having that much water. Those, their cells will literally explode and the, the animal will die just from bleeding out, essentially. All of this is especially true in fish, but it's also true of pretty much anything that lives in the water, whether it's, you know, turtles or even different kinds of mammals. All of that to say, it really annoys me when you find a Pokemon in fresh water and then move out to an ocean route and you find it there as well. Pokemon does this all the time. With some Pokemon like Magikarp, I understand because that's kind of Magikarp's whole shtick is that it is bad at pretty much everything, but it is very hardy and can survive in almost any environment. That's Magikarp's whole thing, sure. But with some Pokemon like Squirtle and Blastoise that you find here on the beach, I've always kind of envisioned them as being freshwater, like pond turtles. However, actually, after, after I kind of looked at it, there's really not a ton of evidence to support that in the games. Uh, you know, in the Fire Red and Leaf Green Pokedex, they are classified as sort of the Water's Edge Pokemon group. So that doesn't specify that it's freshwater, although it is highly implied just based on a lot of the other Pokemon that are found there. As well as in the Let's Go games, you find Squirtle both in the Seafoam Islands, in the middle of the ocean, as well as on routes 24 and 25, which are right by a river, freshwater. So it seems like Pokemon itself doesn't actually know whether the Squirtle line lives in freshwater or saltwater, which is a problem. <laughs> Squirtle would die if you put it in the wrong environment. That was a really long digression, but I really wanted to educate people about this because it bothers me so much when I see this in Pokemon. That is one of my biggest pet peeves about Pokemon that nobody cares about. But this is my channel, so I'm going to complain about it if I want to. In the previous two videos in this series, I talked at quite some length about sort of the predator to prey ratios in both the park course and the jungle course. The park course pretty much only had one larger predator in Tangrowth, and that one, as I've mentioned several times throughout the series, has been kind of iffy because the park course talks about it eating fruit. But also, the jungle has way too many predators, so the really different ends of the spectrum here, but the beach is kind of just very different because aquatic sort of ecosystems do not function the same way that terrestrial ones do. Marine ecosystems especially tend to have a far larger percentage of predatory animals than terrestrial ones do, and that's just sort of the nature of how marine ecosystems are structured from the very bottom level up. The way real world ocean ecosystems are structured is that pretty much everywhere in the upper layers of the water there are these things called phytoplankton. They're essentially the ocean's plants because the ocean doesn't have too many actual plants, but they're microscopic little single-celled or colonial organisms that do photosynthesis. Along with them sort of floating around there are things called zooplankton, which are typically the larvae of things like crabs, uh, some other types of invertebrates usually, as well as some vertebrates, but they eat the phytoplankton. Then slightly bigger things eat the zooplankton, slightly bigger things eat those, and so on and so forth, until you have fish eating fish, and so on. The vast majority of animals that live in the ocean either eat zooplankton or other animals, compared to very few that actually eat plant material just because there's far fewer true plant material in the ocean. Also, such as previously in the series, let's take a look at some of the Pokemon that hypothetically should be here, but that we don't see. There are 25 different Pokemon altogether when considering the day and night version of the beach. However, this bumps up to 47 Pokemon that should be here if we count every Pokemon in all of those 25 Pokemon's evolutionary lines, which happens to be more than the park but slightly less than uh, what should be in the jungle. This is likely because, as we talked about last episode in the jungle, marine ecosystems tend to have a huge amount of sort of mobility throughout an animal's life. Fish that live on the reef tend to move inland to lay their eggs and then go back out to the reef. Whereas once those eggs hatch, they then sort of live uh, along the coast in the shallower waters 
until they get big enough to move out to the reef. So it's very common to find young fish closer to the shore and then the adults out on the reef. This might explain some of the discrepancies that we see in the aquatic Pokemon, but not so much for the ones that live on the land. For example, we see Squirtle and Blastoise, but not Wartortle. If both the adult and the juvenile are there, presumably sort of the adolescent would be there too. If you see both the adult and the, the juvenile in the same location, presumably it stays there for its whole life and doesn't make that sort of reef to shore migration. So where is Wartortle? And also we see Pikachu and Raichu, but we don't see Pichu. Again, we, we see Pichu somewhere else on a completely different island, but not here. I don't actually have a good explanation for the terrestrial ones other than they're further back away from the beach. The beach is also a relatively open and pretty exposed place, so maybe some of the younger ones, such as Pichu, don't want to come out onto the beach just because there's nowhere really to hide. That's the best I can do. That doesn't really explain War Turtle though, but that's the best I got. Also, while writing the script for this episode, I came up with sort of a new theory about where the lentil region in general might be on the Pokemon globe, as it were. So keep an eye out for that in the future. Let me know your thoughts on the beach. In my opinion, even though it does contain my favorite Pokemon of all time, Zangus, I really found it rather underwhelming, of a course. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's like middle of the road. It's no jungle. I love the jungle. That's one of my favorite courses, but let me know your thoughts on all of it down below in the comments. And while you're down there, make sure to leave a thumbs up and or thumbs down if you dislike this video. And while you're down there, why not subscribe so that you get notified when we put out future videos. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at palette underscore you to keep up on all things Pokemon science as well as if you feel like this content's worthy of supporting financially, we do have a Patreon, the link to which you can find down below in the description. I feel like Lapras is bigger than Blastoise. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I feel like it's bigger, right? A Lapras sized thank you to our supporters over on Patreon, Patty Murphy, Sam McCarty, and Jameer Connolly. Your support, as always, is so incredibly immensely appreciated. And lastly, thank you so much just for watching, and as always, there's a time and place for everything.